Excuse me, I gotta set up a second. How's everybody doing today? Oh, I didn't buy that. I said, how's everybody doing today? There you go. That's what I'm talking about. Isn't it good to be in God's house? Amen. In fact, good's not even good enough. It's great to be in God's house. And uh, we serve an awesome God. Amen. All right. I am excited to be here up here with you today. I'm excited to uh, bring you this message and continue the series Amazed. Um, never ceases to amaze me how much uh, God works through us around here. Um, anybody, anybody here, raise your hand now if you've ever been blessed by this congregation in, in some way, the smallest way. Yeah, look at that. See, that's family, folks. That's God working. That is, that's just, whoops, uh-oh, I dropped the bass. Um, that is just awesome to see, awesome to, to be a part of, and uh, there we go. Ah, that's my workout for the day. But the, I am glad you are all here today. I am glad that the people on the virtual campuses of Facebook and YouTube are here with us today. Um, I want you to go ahead, if you got your Bibles with you, if you want, you can turn to Matthew chapter 18. In a little bit, we'll be looking at verses 21 through 35 in Matthew chapter 18. So kind of hold it or mark it in any way, and we'll get to that in just a bit. Um, we're going to be in God's Word today, folks, just like we are every week here at MCC. You know, the leaders of MCC, man, we believe there's no better way to hear from God than to get into His Scriptures his teaching, his authority. Amen? And so it's always good to get together and do that every week. Man, I'm excited to continue this, ser this series, Amazed. It has been a great series. I I've been blessed by all the different topics we've looked at so far. We've been amazed by his creation. We've been amazed by his presence. And last week, Pastor David, man, great job, brother. Great job on, on showing us how amazing God's love is. That, that sermon, it, it truly hit me, and I appreciated uh, what you had to say last week. And this week, we're going to continue with Amazed by, um, well, I want to get to that in a minute. I, first, I want to start with my quick presentation, get it out of the way so you see, everybody stops wondering what's going on with all these charts and stuff. So we're going to do it first and, and get, it, get it out of the way, get it moving here. So uh, today, I want to do just... Uh, a quick and simple presentation of the gospel. The gospel of Jesus. I just want to do a quick presentation of it. It's a good lead into what we're going to talk about today. So I just want to spend a few moments here. Now at the beginning, mankind and God hanging out in the garden together, right? I mean, Adam and Eve got to walk and talk with God. How amazing is that? Any of you ever been just sitting out on your back porch and you see a sunset or maybe taking a walk and you, and you see the beauty of God's creation around you? How cool would it be to just look over? God sipping a sip sweet tea right there with you. Probably extra sweet because we know that's God's nectar. But um, and he just looks and say, thank you. Thank you for all this. That's what Adam and Eve had. They had God right there. I mean, I, I can't even imagine. So that's how things were going. It was good. Until a lousy serpent, a lousy snake shows up, right? Tempts. And the next thing you know, after temptation, Adam and Eve take a bite of the forbidden fruit. And we know firsthand that uh, things change. And at this point, sin has entered the wor world. And it's created this big chasm between God and us. We are separated from him because of sin. Because as we know and as we've talked about God, God is perfect. God is perfect. And sin has no place with God. Sin has no place in a relationship with God. So it's created this big chasm between God and us. All because we had to have a bite of a piece of fruit. But fruit God had forbidden. And this chasm, this sin we have created, because of it, 
If I put my, ah, I put my markers in. Good job, Jeff. Uh, if we, because of it, we have eternal death. Whoops. Did I spell that? Eternal. Okay, S-A, spelling amnesty. If I spell anything wrong, don't say anything to me. Eternal death, right? We have eternal death because of sin. That's, that's what we deserve now. Uh, Romans 3.23 reminds us of that. Romans 6.23, the beginning of it reminds us of that. For all of sin, and that's all of mankind, and falls short of the glory of God. There's the chasm now. The wages of sin is death. That's what we deserve. That is what we deserve because of our sin. Oh, but God. <laughs> David mentioned it last week. Big, big sermon about it, but God is what? Love, right? God is love. His heart is so big for us in a sense. He has so much love for us. He couldn't let this stand. He couldn't let this stand. He had to give us away. He wanted to get back in relationship with us. So what did he do? He did what only God could do. He came up with the perfect plan. The perfect plan. And it, wasn't gonna, it was not going to condemn us anymore. His plan, if we chose to follow it, is going to give us eternal... Gosh, I keep skipping that in for some reason. Eternal life. He says, i got to get mankind back to that. So what does he do? What does he do to get our relationship restored with him? Well, his plan, and we're going to use a crown of thorns to represent him today, was Jesus. His son was the plan. Jesus is going to be the way. He's going to restore this relationship. He's going to be the way to eternal life. Um, Romans 5, 6 and 8, 6 through 8 rather, tell us, when we were utterly helpless, oh, by the way, don't forget, if you haven't been here before, when there's red words up there, I want you to read along with us from the scriptures, okay? So when you see the red words, you read those along with me. So when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. That's all of us. Now, most, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, or most people would not be willing to die for an, un, for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good, especially good. But God showed us his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Whoa! And then in 1 Peter 3.18, it tells us, Christ suffered for our sins once for all. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the Spirit. So God's going to use Jesus to close this gap. And Jesus is going to die for us On a cross. On a cross. Jesus is going to be our sacrifice for all sinners, which is all of us, on the cross. Let's look at all of Romans 6.23 real quick. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal through Christ Jesus our Lord. Folks, we receive an incredible gift, the incredible gift of eternal life. But it's through Jesus and what he did on the cross and overcoming the cross three days later and conquering death. Christ did that for us, and that's how we can receive eternal life is through him. And that shows you how much love God has for us. To send his only son to die for each and every one of us so that we could have eternal life. That takes love to send your child, right? That's how much he loved us. Now, remember, there's only one way to be restored to God. To be restored to a relationship with him. And that is through Jesus Christ. There's no other way. No matter what the world tells you, there is no other way. And the Bible tells us this in John 14, 6. Jesus told him, told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father 
except through. That's it. <laughs> I am the way, the truth, life. No one, no one can come except through me. That's the only, ex- that's the only exception. It's the only way to be restored to relationship is through Christ. If you go to Ephesians 2, 8, 9, you don't have to right now, but it reminds us that we can't earn eternal life, folks. It's, it's great to do good things. It's great to help people out. It's great to be nice, but that doesn't earn you a spot in heaven. It doesn't earn you your restored relationship with God. No, it's only through Christ. John three sixteen, one of the ultimate gospel verses, right? It reminds us, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. What a perfect plan. And the cool part about this plan is you have a choice to make. You can accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior and follow the steps I'm a, that I'm going to describe to you right now. You can choose to hear the gospel, which I just gave you a quick version of. You can choose to hear the gospel, but then you must choose to believe it. You've got to repent of your sin. Repent of your sin. Turn around from your sin. And then confess that he is Lord of your life and follow with baptism, in obedience of baptism, with, and you will be baptized into a restored your relationship, rather, will be restored after you follow those steps to God. Wow. That's it. You can choose to accept or not. John 5, chapter 20, or yeah, John chapter 5, rather, verse 24 says, I tell you the truth. Those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they've always, already passed from death into life. What a promise. What a perfect plan. But the choice is up to you. Folks, that's the gospel in a nutshell. If you think the gospel is amazing, give God a round of applause right now. God's love and plan for us, it's amazing. And today, I want to quickly just focus on one little part of this plan. David hit the beginning of this plan with love. That's the basis for all of this, is is God's love for us. But the part of the plan I want to, it's it's the essential, it's the central part of the gospel itself. And it's, it's, I want to focus on this, the cross specifically. I want to focus on that today, and we're going to be looking at, at being amazed by mercy Ah, mercy. Forgiveness and grace. Mercy, forgiveness, whoops, can't find the hole. There we go. And grace. That is what we're going to focus on. That's what we're going to look at being amazed by today. Mercy, forgiveness, and grace. The three big gifts from God. These gifts are so important to us. I want to start with mercy and grace. Mercy and grace, the ones on the, on, the, on the arms of the cross out here, mercy and grace. These two terms are, they get confused a lot, but they truly have different meanings. And if God's love, if we had a coin up here that represented God's love, mercy would be on one side and grace would be on the flip side. Okay, that mercy and grace would be the flip sides of the coin of God's love, if that was here as a rep- representation. On one side, we have mercy. And biblical mercy is God not giving us what we do deserve. It's God not, not giving us what we do deserve. This, this mercy, this gift, it's given freely by God, and it's often been characterized as a compassionate love to the weak as a compassionate love to the weak. You see, mercy, it's the bridge. It's the the transition, the bridge to forgiveness. 
That's what mercy does. It, it transitions into God's forgiveness. Uh, I want to give you a real-life example of mercy. As Vice President George Bush represented the U.S. at the funeral of former Soviet leader Brezhnev, Bush, deeply moved by a silent protest carried out by Brezhnev's widow. You see, she stood motionless by the coffin until seconds, just seconds, before it was closed. Then just as the soldiers touched the lid to close it, Brezhnev's wife performed an act of great courage and hope, a gesture that, may, that must surely rank as probably one of the most pro profound acts of civil, civil disobedience, especially in Russia, that was ever committed. She reached down and made the sign of the cross on her husband's chest. There in the citadel of secular, atheistic power, the wife of the man who had run all that power and who did not believe in God, hoped that her husband was wrong. She hoped there was another life and that that life was best represented by Jesus who died on a cross. And she hoped that that same Jesus might have mercy on her husband. He didn't believe. She knew he deserved death. But she hoped for mercy. She hoped for mercy. Now, biblical grace on the other side of the coin, that is, that is giving us something we do not deserve. So mercy gives us, or is not giving us, rather, something that we do deserve. It's keeping us from something we do deserve. But grace, on the other hand, is giving us something we don't deserve, we do not deserve. Grace is also a gift given freely by God, and it's been characterized as a generous love to the unworthy. A generous love to the unworthy. We're not worthy. We don't, we deserve death. But because of his mercy, we don't get death. And because of his grace, we get the gift of eternal life, if we choose to accept. You see, mer as mercy is the bridge to forgiveness, grace is the bridge from forgiveness into eternal life. Into eternal life. It, is, it, it reconciles us, it restores us to our relationship with God. It's the final step, that grace we are given. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. I mentioned it earlier. Now we're going to look at it. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. We can't take credit for that. It's completely a gift Grace is a gift. There's nothing we do to deserve it. It's what Christ did on the cross. And us accepting what Christ did for us on the cross, that allows us to accept the gift of grace. How amazing is this gift of grace? It makes me think of this. When we get to heaven, there will be no contest to see who was the most deserving of God's grace. Because none of us deserve it. So there's not going to be a contest to see who deserves it more. There will only be one contest in heaven. When we look back and see what we were before. When we see the pit from which he rescued us. When we recall how confused we were. When we remember how God reached out and took us into his family. And how he held us in his hands. And when we see Jesus... Jesus, who loved us and gave himself for us. The only contest will be to see which one of us will sing my grandfather's favorite hymn. Amazing grace. Sing it with me. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now was blind, but now 
I see. I'm telling you, my grandpa might win that contest. <laughs> He'd sing that song everywhere we went. Going to the farm to get on the horses or clean up the stalls. Grandpa was humming or singing that song. Go to Mon driving in from White Heath to Monticello, he was singing that song. I think we could have gone to church and sung that song four times every Sunday and he'd been happy. But that's going to be the only contest because we all deserve it equally. We all have done things that, that cause this chasm between God. But his grace, his amazing grace, what a gift. Now the cool thing about mercy and grace is they're wrapped up as part of forgiveness. They're all wrapped up in this on the cross. Like I said, mercy leads us to forgiveness, and, forgive, and uh, grace leads us from forgiveness into the gift of eternal life. Forgiveness means to wipe the slate clean, to pardon or to cancel a debt. However, God's forgiveness, it's even deeper and truer than any type of of forgiveness we could give. His forgiveness is an action. It is an action on his part to release sinners from judgment and freeing those sinners from divine penalty. What a forgiveness. It is a gift from God. It is unmerited. There's, there's nothing we do to deserve it. We don't deserve it. And there's no way we can ever repay God for our sins. We can't, there's nothing we could ever do. That's why he came up with the perfect plan. Because he knew we, we couldn't do it on our own. And so God offered up forgiveness on our behalf by Christ. You see, when Christ, when he chose to die for our sins on the cross, he became our atonement for sin, each and every one of us. Everybody who was alive then and everybody who would live until he comes back. That sacrifice allowed us to receive the forgiveness. There are few words ever used in the original language of the Bible that convey this type of forgiveness well. But there was one most often, and it was powerfully used by Jesus all through the Gospels. It shows us how God's forgiveness differs from the world's idea of forgiveness. The Greek word, afiumi, afiumi. You see it, oh, it should be coming up here. Greek word, afiumi, it defines forgiveness as this, to send away with the intent that, as, that it's as if it never happened. It's like, it's gone. To send it away as if it never happened. So whenever we read that Jesus says that your sins have been forgiven, Jesus is saying, I sent your sins away from you as if they have never occurred. As if they've never occurred. How many kids wish their parents would forgive them that way? <laughs> yeah. But Jesus does. Are you amazed by that? Are you amazed that God, that Jesus, when they forgive you your sins, is as it, is it, as it never happened, never occurred? Who here is thankful for that type of forgiveness? Can I get an amen? Yes. You see, forgiveness, it's a key subject in the Bible and in life. The need for forgiveness is one of the most essential experiences in our lives. Because at some point, we all do something wrong, every one of us. At some point, we mess up. We husbands, we mess up a lot, don't we, guys? But we all mess up. We all do something wrong. And it's not always intentional. And we all make mistakes. And, and sometimes we hurt people. And at some point in our lives, we also tend to break God's laws, whether we mean to or not. And that's the sin. That's called sin. Mark 10, 26 and 27 tells us, The disciples were astounded. Then who in the world can be saved, they asked. Jesus looked at them and intently said, Humanly speaking, it is impossible. But not with God. Everything is possible. With God. With God, it's all possible. So knowing how important forgiveness is, I just kind of want to finish this sermon by focusing just on God's amazing forgiveness. Just on that for just a moment. 
During a children's sermon one Sunday morning, a pastor held up an ugly-looking summer shirt, maybe looked like that one, that he wore occasionally around the house. And he explained to the children that someone said the shirt was ugly and should be thrown away. The pastor said, this really hurt me. He, he explained, I'm having trouble forgiving the person who said those mean things to me. And he looked at the kids and said, do you think I should forgive this person? And then immediately, his six-year-old daughter, Alicia, raised her hand. She said, yes, you should. No hesitation. And he looked at her and said, but why? The person hurt my feelings. To which Alicia wisely answered, because you're married to her. <laughs> Some of you thought Alicia had said it, didn't you? Right? I mean, we've all messed up. We've all done something, and we all deserve forgiveness. You see, we are called to forgive as Jesus forgave. Ephesians 4.32 tells us, Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Which makes God's forgiveness even more amazing when you think about it. Because if we would live our lives and forgive others as he's forgiven us, how much better would this world be? Jesus even talks about this and gives us some insight to forgiveness. And if you did as I suggested, or if you had your Bibles and you went ahead and opened them to Matthew chapter 18, get to those now. We're going to read those verses. And as we read these verses, we're going to see four responses to God's forgiveness. Four responses we should all have to God's forgiveness. Matthew 18, we're going to start verse 21. Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. I want to stop there for a second. You see, one of our responses is that our forgiveness must be constant. One of our, it's got to be constant. We've got to be forgiving every day, all the time. We, we should not, could not, and, and we should not cheapen God's forgiveness by calculating and counting the number of offenses against us. The number of offenses one person does against us or a group of people does against us. We shouldn't do this just so we can get to some maximum number of offenses and we get to finally retaliate. Yes, we reached 491. We can retaliate. No, that's not what Jesus meant here. The number Jesus gives is not meant to be an equation or a final number. It's meant to tell Peter and us folks that our forgiveness should have no bounds and should be a way of life for every one of his followers. So our forgiveness must be constant. Let's pick back up. We're at verse 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of the debtors was brought in, owed him millions of dollars. Millions of dollars that he couldn't pay. So his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife, his children, and everything he owed to pay the debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me and I will pay it all. We'll stop there again. You see, another response to God's forgiveness is that we acknowledge that we need his forgiveness. We have to acknowledge that we need his forgiveness. We need God's mercy and grace and forgiveness to, to be reconciled to him. We need forgiveness. We've all fallen short. We've all sinned. We should be amazed and thankful every day for his forgiveness in our lives. That is what leads to our restoration. We all need to acknowledge that we need his forgiveness because we all do. For all have sinned. We're going to kick back up now in verse 27. Then his master was filled with pity for him, and he released him and forgave his debt. That's our third response. God's forgiveness, to, to his forgiveness rather, is that we accept his forgiveness. Another response is we have to accept his forgiveness. Thank you. For your forgiveness we accept 
So many str Christians struggle, and non-Christians alike actually, struggle with guilt and condemnation. And as Christians, we are always trying to pay God back for what we did wrong. With Jesus, Jesus on the cross already made it right. It's right because of what he did. There's nothing we can do, but Christ did it. But we try. We try. In our humanity, we try. But God's unconditional love, it's, it's a difficult concept for people to accept. Because in this world, we're used to paying for everything we receive, right? You don't just get to walk into Schnooks and pick up all the ice cream and just walk out the door, right? You've got to pay for all that ice cream or your milk. Or you can't just go to the gas pump, fill it up, and take off. Oh, it would be nice. But they want your money. <laughs> That's what we're used to doing in this world. You, 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 you get something, you pay for it. You, you receive something for it. That's what we're used to. But that's not how things work with God. That's not how things work with the gospel, with this perfect plan. That's not how things work with his forgiveness. Because thankfully, God's not like us people. We need to learn that whether or not we feel forgiven, whether we feel it or not, we are forgiven. We are forgiven. We need to accept his forgiveness today. I want you to allow God to wash the hurt and regret, regret from past sins away with his transforming power and his love and truth. If you're struggling to accept his forgiveness, I want you to take time to pray for an accepting heart that lives in freedom of God's mercy, grace, and forgiveness. Take time. In fact, there's no better time than the present. Everybody bow your heads for me, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we take this moment and this time to pray that you would help all of us open our hearts to be accepting hearts to know that you have given us mercy, forgiveness, and grace. And it's nothing we can do to earn it. Oh, but Lord, we thank you for it and we accept it today. And if there's anyone here who's really struggling with it, Lord, let them feel your presence. Let them feel your love around them, either through us or you do it directly. But let them know and let them see that by accepting this, they will have a freedom like no other to move forward and to do the plan you have set for them. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, let's go back to verse 28. That's where we left off. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. Just a few thousand dollars compared to his millions? Woo! But he grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. I want my money now. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me and I will pay it, he pleaded. Sound familiar? He just did that to the king. I, I can pay it. Just give me more time. That's what his fellow servant's asking for. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the, of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. Then the king called in the man who, had, who he had forgiven and said, You evil servant. I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? That's our fourth response right there, folks. That's our fourth resp response to his forgiveness. It's that we must be forgiving to others. We get forgiveness, we have to give it right back to others. Now, forgiving the person that has hurt us is often one of the toughest things we as Christians are called to do. It's not easy. It is not easy. In fact, Marianne Wils Williamson, a, an author, wrote, uh, had this quote. Forgiveness is not always easy. At times it feels more painful than the wound we suffered. To forgive the one that inflicted it, and yet there is no peace without forgiveness. Folks, we can't move forward in our lives without 
being willing to forgive others and to give them the forgiveness. Now, forgiveness doesn't mean you say that the hurt doesn't exist. Just because you forgave someone doesn't mean you're saying that hurt never existed or it doesn't exist or that it didn't matter or doesn't matter. Nor does it just simply make everything all right. But what it does is it allows you to let go of the hurt and let God, let God deal with the one who hurts you. You see, forgiveness sets you free and allows you to move on with your life. It allows you to go into a stronger relationship with God and not let Satan, don't let Satan do it. Don't let him drag you down into more sin because you're angry and hurt. You've got to let it go. You, you have to forgive. And again, it's not easy. In fact, we, the leadership here at MCC, know it's not easy. And I'm going to do a little PSA right now for a program in our church. If you ever when rather not if you ever but when we open up the opportunities for freedom groups again jump on the chance to get into a freedom group this is exactly the kind of thing that the freedom groups looks at looking at things in your past or things that you're currently dealing with that you either haven't forgiven yourself for or, or let God's forgiveness work in your life or you maybe haven't forgiven someone else for Freedom groups will blow you away with some stuff you didn't even realize you were holding on to. I'm telling you, I've been through them. Talk to Pastor David. He's been, and there's many other people around here. Go ask them. One of the most powerful studies I ever did was freedom groups, and it's for this reason. And it made my relationship even closer to God, which blew me away. <laughs> You need to take a moment, if you get a chance, with your schedules, I mean, when we offer the next set of freedom groups, to jump at the chance. And if you want more information, like I said, talk to myself, Mike Tilford down here, Roger Lloyd's over here, David's over here, and, and, and uh, Dixie Schoonover. There's many ladies that have been through this stuff. We want you to jump at this chance. And it's not for us. It's, it's not a program. It's about the church. It's about your individual relationship with Christ, with God. So jump at it if you can. All right. That's enough of my public service announcement. Remember this. We aren't simply, though, just called to forgive as Christ forgave. We are commanded and expected to do so. Verse 34. Let's finish these two verses up. Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. That's what my heavenly Father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. That was Christ. Jesus said that. That's my heavenly Father. Well, that's what my heavenly Father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from the heart. God wants us expects us, commands us to practice forgiveness so that we can have a greater capacity to live for Jesus. Now, forgiveness is a choice. And it's a commitment. If you make the choice to do it and are committed to do it daily, you are going to reflect God's love to others. That's what forgiveness is all about. That's why God wants us to do it, to reflect his love. There was a man who was once talking with John Wesley, and he once bragged, John, I never forgive. Wesley very, very wisely said, then, sir, I hope you have never sinned. We are called to forgive. And if you've been forgiven, the necessary outcome from God's forgiveness is that you be a person of forgiveness, that you forgive from the heart. Which leads us right up to today's takeaway. Folks, as a Christian, as Christians, we are forgiven and must be forgiving. We are forgiven and must be forgiving. I want you to search inside yourself today. And if you're holding back some forgiveness from someone who... who you, well, 
someone that you just have held it back for, for whatever reason, why don't you make today the day you let it go? Why don't you make today the day you let go of the hurt or the hate or the anger or the frustration? Let go of it. Forgive them. And then let God, let God, who loves you so much and wants you to be free, let God deal with that person who hurts you. You need to move forward with whatever plans God has for your life. And you need to live free so that you can show the love of Christ to everyone. We are forgiven. And we must be forgiving.